My name is Richard Ackland. I edit a couple of law journals. One's called Justinian and the other is the Gazette of Law and Journalism. And I also uh, contributor to the Sydney Morning Herald. Um, and I've been invited by the Wheeler Centre to host this panel tonight and ask questions and keep it stirring along. Um, I've also been asked by the Wheeler Centre for you to turn off your heart pacemakers and mobile phones and uh, glucose drips or whatever might make a noise and um, we can um, we can proceed and also there's about 10 I hope even a bit more minutes at the end where you know we really hope that you're going to be engaged with this discussion which is under the general rubric of taking liberties with the press and uh, I don't think anyone in the room would be unaware of the of the nasty stain that has uh, spread over journalism at the moment, and um, maybe it's uh, spreading wider than just the uh, news international situation and news of the world in in England. Um, there are inquiries also in the United States, and there's a sort of smaller investigation at News Limited in Australia. Um, these are these are really incredible events for journalism and out of them a lot of issues tumble. Um, the power of the media, the concentrated ownership of the media, the media's influence with important uh, pillars of the state, whether it be politics, the police, the law, and it se certainly seems, at least from the English experience, that um, at least all of those have been corrupted uh, to varying degrees. So these are the issues that we hope to sort of digest tonight and get in touch with, and we've got an excellent panel to do that. They will not only discuss it, but they will solve all of these things. <laughs> um, on my left, Margaret Simons. Margaret is well known uh, to, to Melbourne audiences particularly. Um, she writes the Content Makers blog. She also writes for Crikey. She lectures at Swinburne on journalism and the advanced journalistic, independent journalistic foundation for public foundation interest journalism. journalism. <laughs> and um, she's also um, um, written a couple of wonderful books. Mark Day. Um, I think whenever the two words Mark Day are mentioned, there's a third word that always follows, and that's veteran. <laughs> uh, veteran journalist. Um, he's been in journalism longer than most people, I think, and he's, um, I suppose he's identified with the Murdoch Press now because he, he writes for the, a media column for The Australian. And he, well, he's run Truth newspaper, he's run radio, and he's he's been a, He's been a journalist in, in all sorts of manifestations. Professor, Emeritus Professor Rod Tiffin from the University of Sydney is one of our leading um, academics on media and he's written um, widely on the subject and some, also some wonderful books and he's, he's uh, followed this issue very closely. But I, and so I'll start with you, Rod, if I, yeah. if I may. Are there ever an occasion in journalism where it would be acceptable to um, breach ethics in the public interest, and not only breach ethics, but we could take it one step further, breach the criminal law? Uh, well, let's start with ethics. Um, I, I think there's often cases in journalism and in many other walks of life where there are competing ethical considerations. and. Uh, I'm not sure that phone tapping would ever be justified or breaking into other people's emails would be justified. But sometimes if there's very serious wrongdoing suspected and the front doors are shut, the spin operations are in place, then I think there are reasons for going in the back door or, you know, using um, perhaps, um, I won't say sting operations, but for example, when, when Liz Jackson um, on Four Corners filmed people smugglers in Indonesia, that was a breach of journalistic ethics, but you could argue the public interest outweighed it. Hmm. On the other hand, doesn't seem to me that it's legitimate 
to eavesdrop on uh, someone's phone to reveal that Prince William has some problems with his knee. Mm. So, you know, it gets a bit fuzzy then, doesn't it, Mark Day? I mean, some occasions there might be a justification of the public yep. interest to yep. do something I, I, over the line, and, I, but mostly it isn't. I say that there are occasions when um, breaching your ethics to front up and say, hello, my name is Mark Day, I'm from the Australian, uh, which is one of the AJA rules that uh, or MEA, that's our order. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, look, uh, there are occasions when that's um, uh, counterproductive. And if the. Uh, what what aim, occasions would those be? Well, if the aim is to uh, reveal malfeasance, wrongdoing, corruption, public officials on the take, and the only way to get that information in a form which will stand up before the courts mm. is to breach your ethics, um, yes, I think it is justifiable. And there's a greater good. Uh, I was recently in the UK and I sat down with uh, a friend of mine who uh, worked for the London Sun. This was before the Millie Dowler, before the thing blew, and he spent a lot of time explaining just how uh, essential it was that journalists do these things and he, he cited cases like the Pakistani cricket betting scandal. We couldn't do that in Australia, not only breaching ethics, we couldn't do it because we would breach the law. It, it, would, it would be against the Listening Devices Act. Uh, you know, you're just not allowed, according to our law, to do what they do in the UK. So I think we just got to keep in mind as we go through the, this evening that there are different levels. In the UK it's very much an environment of anything goes uh, in the public interest, in the name of the greater good. And th th my friend even argued that there was a greater good in outing Max Mosley for his uh, Nazi... Well, it wasn't Nazi in the end, that's why he got all the money. <laughs> uh, his, his peccadilloes with, um, with, with prostitutes. Um, I find that difficult to believe. And uh, on the telephone hacking, he made the point that it, uh, the, the public doesn't give a damn about celebrities or even princes or princesses. But when it got into the realm of, quote, a real person, a real victim and so on, then it was... The uh, dead girl. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. And the public yeah. was aghast and quite right, weren't we all? Mm. But yes, there are times when you, you I think, in, in the name of the greater good, have to keep your eye on where you're going rather than the methodology employed, mm. yes. And Margaret, what, the greater good, does that justify a bit of touch of criminality now well, and then? Well, you know, it's not even in terms of a breach of ethics because just about every ethical code that applies to journalism, either individual organisations such as News Limited or the AJA code, the MEAA code, mm. um, have a clause in it which says, you know, where the public interest overrides, you know, it's possible to um, to do things such as fail to identify yourself and so mm. on. So it's, you know, it's very hard to say, well, that's mm. definitely a breach of the mm. ethics because the codes of ethics in themselves anticipate that there will be occasions on which the public interest overrides. But it's a difficult question because, I mean, the whole journalism relies on the unauthorised disclosure. That's, mm. you know, what most journalism that isn't public relations is. <laughs> and most people in this room, I imagine, that, well, how many people think that WikiLeaks was a good thing? The WikiLeaks cables, okay? Mm -hmm. Fair proportion. How many people think phone hacking was a good thing? Very few. So the question is, where do you draw the line and why? Mm. And the answer, of course, is the public interest. But I, what I would say is that journalists in general, and certainly journalists in this country, don't give enough thought to what we actually mean by that. Well, no one knows what we mean by it. It's uh, just one of those loose terms that can be dropped in to justify anything and a judge's idea about the public can just maybe entirely different to Exactly. Uh, to frequently yours. are. <laughs> <laughs> Much to the chagrin of those who have to pay the mm. libels. And the money. overwhelming number of cases in this News of the World scandal, it would be very hard to justify any sense of public interest. Oh, I agree with that. Mm. Yeah. Mm. And, uh, you know, maybe the Pakistan cricket, you know, mm. betting, mm. Yeah. sting. But that wasn't a phone but that hacking. Wasn't phone hacking. No, 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 yeah. no. But it but was right, a breach of ethics. It was a breach uh, of ethics. Yeah. 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 In 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 mm. Britain, virtually mm. anything goes, whether it's a sting using the yeah. shake. Mm. But here, this is not the case. So well, you, that's interesting. All right. Well, let, let's go with that one. Here, it's not the case. We're clean as a whistle here. I think. Um, look. 
Um, I've uh, edited newspapers, and from time to time I've, been, I've asked a question, as editors do. How did we get this story? What's our source? Who, who's our, where's our information coming from? How strong is it? All those things that editors have to ask. And I have on occasion been told, it's better that you don't ask, which, of course, means that I say, well, now you're bound, you must tell me. And I have been informed that pictures of uh, people involved in the news, uh, murder victims, that kind of thing, have been lifted from family mantelpieces in the great Sydney time-honoured tradition. Um, and uh, once you become aware of that, well, you still run the picture because you know your competition's got the same picture and if you... If you don't, they will, and you can't allow that. But at the same time, I have counselled on frequent occasions reporters and photographers mm. per, to you know, make sure you take that back and make amendments with the people, mm. you know, and to, to, as best you can, do the right thing. Um, these are difficult areas, but... Um, anyway, uh, but it, 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 you remember the days of the sun and the mirror? Mm. The competition was so intense that the people in the field were the ones who were not remembering their yes. codes of ethics. Well, Tiffin, do you think that is the, the, the basis of the illegalities in, in England? Because the competition is so acute with the tabloids in particular that they have to, you know, yeah. stoop to do anything. Whereas here there's very little competition. Well, yes. I mean, when we look at... Um, the tabloids in Britain, they're all competing with each other. So you've got hyper competition and they're especially competing in, with each other in areas like royalty, celebrity, sport and crime. Yeah. And, uh, and, but it's also just to make a slightly different point, Richard, we keep thinking of these things as if they're eternal and ongoing. I was talking to Jeremy Tunstall some years ago before all this broke. And Jeremy did the first big study of journalists in, in Britain, reporters in Britain, around about 1970. And then he did a follow-up in the early 90s. And he told me one of the biggest changes was that in 1970 there was almost no payment to sources, whereas by the 1990s it was rife. So it's not like tabloids have always been like this. It, there's a sort of dynamic, a process, and one group's, one group's breaking of the rules in, escalates another group's breaking of the rules, and, and you get away with something once, so you think you can try it a bit further next time. And what we've had is this process of, uh, of these things. I, my guess is the problem about tabloids in Australia is one more of monopoly arrogance than of hyper competition. Mm. And I would be very surprised if these phone hacking things go on a lot here. What do you um, say, Mark? Well, I think, um, I mean, it would be a brave person who'd say no journalist in Australia ever hacked a phone, and I'm not going to say that it might have happened, but it's certainly not institutionalised. Mm. And I would be very surprised well, if it's common. About, but there are other problems. Mm. Mm. Well, all right, what are the other problems? Well, I think most of us who've worked in their newsrooms can think of occasions on which fo uh, photographs have been doctored or fabricated, mm. um, sometimes detected by the editor, sometimes mm. stopped, not always. Mm. Um, I think failure to identify oneself as a journalist, including mm. on occasions when the public mm. interest isn't strong enough to justify that, I think that happens quite mm. frequently. And the underlying problem, I would say, is a lack of um, awareness of what the codes are. And this is something which I've had established in recent weeks with News Limited about. Um, News Limited has an excellent code of professional conduct, which mm. is meant to govern all its editorial employees. Mm. I actually do training at News Limited publications quite often, and I routinely ask how many of you have been given a copy of this code, how many of you have read it? And usually one or two in the class, if I'm mm. lucky. Um, News Limited has now started publishing it on the mastheads of all of their publications, which is a good move. But that should have been done right from the start. Yeah. It, Most journalists are not sufficiently aware of the existing codes and they certainly don't think about it. There is no training in the newsrooms on them. The yes. level of awareness yes. of concepts like the public interest and how you wrestle with that is yes. distressingly low, which means we're vulnerable you to more said, serious I ethical breaches. In one of your, um, I'm not sure if it was in Crikey or your blog, you said, look, this is big, this story, what's mm. happening in London, this is big. It is big. And it is a 
you know, ramifications for journalism that are profound and shoes are going to fall, including shoes here. Mm. Now, how close are they to falling here? Well, I think um, one of the things that the News of the World scandal has done is accelerate something that was going to happen anyway, which is the end of the Rupert Murdoch era. Now, he's an old man, so obviously he mm. wasn't going to go on forever. But the thing which it has cast great doubt on is the succession. Um, it's now, I think, extremely unlikely that Rupert Murdoch will be succeeded by a member of his own family. Mm. Now, what that means is that uh, the will of the old man, which has kept what's largely an entertainment company, News Corporation internationally, um, you know, its best assets are things like The Simpsons and so on, has kept that harness to news journalism. And it's largely Rupert Murdoch's will that has mm. done that. So those bonds, I think, will be severed. Mm. And the question then is, what happens to newspapers such as The Australian, for example, in Australia, mm. which doesn't make a profit, probably doesn't even break even. These figures are never released, so we can't be sure. And we may lose it. Mm. Now, many on the left would say, <laughs> good riddance. I wouldn't say good riddance at all. No. I think, um, I think some very fine journalism is published in The Australian, but more to the point, whether you love it or hate it at the moment, it's a national broadsheet. Mm. And without it, we will be the poorer. So who ends up in control of all that? I mean, is it some sort of equity fund or no. corporate, corporatized mm. sort of management? That, no, uh, I think, I think um, Rupert has a lot of problems at the moment, and um, the, the, most of them centre around corporate governance. Uh, Rupert has not been good at that over the years because he has seen himself in that old-fashioned press proprietor role. Uh, when he took the company to America, uh, I'm not sure that he was quite a, as uh, aware as he should have been about their uh, demands for corporate government and um, for everything to be done at a public company according to the book. Um, now, I think Margaret's quite right. The uh, Murdoch era is close to being over. The Rupert era is close to being over. I think she's also right in that it is now highly unlikely that one of the children will succeed at the head of the company. Um, the time frames here are interesting. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised to see um, Rupert become chairman and no longer chief executive, with that passing to uh, Chase Carey. Uh, the first non-Murdoch chief executive. I wouldn't be surprised to see that happen this year, uh, but certainly within the next year or so. But um, there is no, there is no process that I understand that can get the Murdoch family to divest. And while ever they hold their uh, nearly 40% of the voting shares, which the represent 12% of the, the total capital, they will be a very, very loud voice on any board. And quite rightly, they own the shares. I mean, they uh, own the voting shares. Let's they own the voting voting shares, voting. and therefore they're entitled to vote. But I think the. But that's just, a bit of a structural artifice, isn't it? It that, is. That, uh, well, no more, no more so than many other, including the New York Times, is that they have um, dual voting. Um, systems, uh, and it's approved by the, the corporate regulators in Delaware in America. So <laughs> <laughs> everything's approved in Delaware. <laughs> That's right. That's why they're in Delaware along with all the others. Um, but look, um, you know, as so you, you're saying there there might well be a um, a change of management at the top. Rupert sort of shuffling well, off Rupert, to, to say, Rupert. but. Rupert, the control of, of the Murdochs over these papers will still continue. Well, that? I think... I, yeah, I, and, uh, unless they choose to sell, and they may do that. Yeah. Well, I mean, that, is, that tends to assume that the Murdoch family, the next generation, that is, speak with one voice, and I think it's increasingly clear that they don't, necessarily. Yes, yes. Um, and then, of course, you've got the Wendy Deans and Wendy's children, you know, you have a whole mm. succession of complications there which um, together, I think, it make it very unlikely that if we look forward five years, that but the Murdoch what, family will be what, um, I mean, one of the speculations, of course, is that the Australian papers will be hived off, even mm. that Lachlan Murdoch may be mm. persuaded to buy them. I think that was one of Michael mm. Wolfe's theories. Yeah. Um, which I don't believe it's him. May, maybe not. I mean, he would probably have to get rid of his interest in Channel 10 if he, mm. if he did it. But um, the alternative are, are private equity funds, 
which doesn't you know, strike journalists with a lot of joy because then it would be a ruthlessly cut and slash profit driven sort of operation. We need to be very careful what we wish for here I think mm. because the um, uh, newspapers in their print form are very much challenged at the moment to accelerate the problems and, and the process towards what I think is an inevitable demise of print products may not be uh, what we want. Um, uh, and I think the point uh, Margaret quite rightly made is that there's still an awful lot of good journalism, not only on the Australian, but there's an awful lot of good journalism being conducted by good journalists all through Australia and, and uh, around the world. And it's quite wrong that they should be uh, stereotyped and tarnished uh, because of this uh, incident or this series of incidents in the UK. I mean, there's no escaping the fact that it was um, terrible, uh, dastardly, mm. wrong, all, you call it what you like, no escaping that and no attempt to. But that doesn't mean to say that we should take that and therefore destroy what is not so much an industry but a way of life for all of us. Do you think, Rod Tiffin, a public inquiry can get to the bottom of all this and fix it up or is that just a in bit of Britain political or in Australia? Here? Or... Um, look, I'd, I'd rather not speculate as far into the future as we've been doing. I, I, I think the, um, it's very interesting that Rupert Murdoch has been a Republican all his life, and yet when it comes to corporate governance, he's a complete monarchist and thinks, <laughs> and thinks that hereditary succession is the way to go. And that's a complete intellectual absurdity, and it will be seen more and more by News Corp shareholders, probably especially the non-voting ones, as a nonsense, and uh, as it is in North Korea at the moment, and uh, and various other places. Um, I and I just like to sort of go back a little. I don't think because the phone hacking, etc., went on in in uh, Britain that that happens elsewhere. You but don't. I, I don't. But I do think that it is an ethically challenged corporation. Its organisational culture is that, and that stems from the top. Mm. That stems from the very top. Mark will no doubt bite my head off in a moment. Glenn Beck in, uh, um, in Fox News... He didn't need to tap any phones to talk about the victims of the Norwegian massacre as like a Hitler youth camp. I don't think he got that from tapping their phones, right? It, because there's no news you, on you, Fox News. Are you news. blaming Rupert for that? Uh, well, Rupert... Or the, or the culture of News Corp? Yes, because... Well, because... Who, who owns Fox News in America? Rupert does. Who yeah, hired Rupert, all the Rupert key people? Rupert doesn't get on the phone and tell Glenn Beck what to say or Bill O'Reilly or anyone else. No, no, but he, he's in charge of hiring them, knowing very well the sorts of but, things they say. Uh, well, he's, he's in charge of a corporation that says, I want to have a network which, which attracts viewers, which is popular with the people to whom I am offering my product. I want to get as many viewers as I can. I want to get the, the kind of people who will attract an audience. And if I judge that in the USA environment that the media generally is so left-leaning, I see an opportunity to have a right-leaning voice in there which will give people a choice. Mm -hmm. And lo and behold, a lot more are choosing it. Not because of anything that Rupert says or any political uh, viewpoint that he wants to get over. It's because the, the, the market opportunity is there. If Rupert's guilty of... Well, he might be guilty of many things, but one thing he's guilty of is putting popular products into the market. And you see this right from Avatar and Titanic, right through Fox News and, and B Sky B in Britain, vastly different because they're different markets. He has a third of a third of, of Sky News in Australia. Equally different to the other two because they're different markets. It's content and, control. And, and, and the newspapers, they can be blamed for many things, but being popular 
is what they are meant to be. Okay, Margaret, being popular, does that justify, you know, sort of hysterical uh, right-wing outburst on Fox News? Is that is well, that a reasonable let's justification? Leave, let's leave the left and right out of it, because I always find those terms more confusing than helpful these days. When you get to Fox but, News. Um, <laughs> Fox <laughs> News may be the exception <laughs> of that. Um, being, you know, we're talking about different things. When you talk about being popular as a movie, an Avatar, for example, or a Simpsons or something of that sort, that's different from talking about a news service. Now, journalism has always been recognised as having a public purpose, a high public purpose, as well as the need to be commercial, to make a profit, to be part of a, of a business. Um, and so different standards apply, and I think we mean different things when we talk about popularity. Yeah. Um, I would agree with, with Rob that News Corporation has a particular powerful culture. I think it has been a culture with powerful good in it for journalism and also powerful ill in it mm. for journalism. And at the mm. moment, we're seeing some of the worst of it in England. But the other thing I'd say about journalism, everybody's talking about this as a stain on journalism. And they're missing the other side. When a whole society, as in the UK, has been corrupted, who's going to reveal that? Who's going to write that story? Only a journalist. The Guardian. In this case, Nick Davies and The Guardian, which pursued this story for years on their own, often derided and criticised by other colleagues. That, too, was journalism. Mm. So this is... The whole news of the world affair is, yes, sustained, yes, dreadful, but it's about two different kinds of journalism, um, and I think it's really important to remember that. Yes, Rob. Yeah. Well, I think the very interesting thing is if we were having this discussion on June the 10th this year, we would be discussing this scandal as, why didn't it ever take off? You know, Rebecca uh, Wade said in 2003, I think it was, payments are made to police. <coughs> Two people from News of the World and the, the private eye and the royal journalists uh, went to, to jail in 2006. And yet what we had through all that period, more or less apart from The Guardian, was a complete passivity by politicians and other news media who would report the public events and never follow through on any of it. And then the breaking of this uh, impasse came in early July when uh, um, uh, it was revealed that Millie... Um, yeah. Millie yeah. Dally, as, um phone had been interfered with and then it had an unstoppable momentum mm. so there's two equally interesting stories why did it take the scandal so long to really take off and then once it took off the huge momentum that had developed so quickly when suddenly all three parties, none of whom wanted to criticise Murdoch, are now all criticising Murdoch. And every other news organisation in, in Britain, including the BBC, including the uh, other popular media who barely touched it, are now running full bore on it. And uh, it, it's, it's a really interesting sort of yeah, before well, and after. Uh, Rod, um, once again referring to my um, uh, lunches and discussions in London just before this break, everybody was into it. There's no question everybody was doing it. Was the BBC doing Everybody know, was doing I'm, lots. I know. So, I'm, I'm, the, the I, I won't go that far, but I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be surprised. And you say everybody in it Fleet was Street was paying... It common practice amongst British journalists to indulge in um, phone hacking. Well, let no it come one, out. No one is suing Let it come out. out. No, 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 well, just a moment. There's just 35 moment. cases against news. Because as soon as it broke in, um, in 06... Uh, there were some very extensive clean-ups going around all the emails and all the offices. Finding the evidence that involved the others is going to be um, a lot more difficult. But um, I think there's been one charge levelled at a mirror journalist already. Um, there are other allegations. And look, in time, I think it will be revealed that it's more widespread than just the news of the world, none of which makes it right. I'm not using this as a justification to the news of the world, but it, 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 Fleet Street common knowledge, um, yes, it was happening widely. Mm. And, and that's one of the reasons why 
The other papers, the competitors to the Sun and News of the World, didn't jump in, boots and all. Mm. Um, and the, the, the Guardian and the Observer, I'm not sure of the Guardian, certainly the Observer, which is a stable mate, um, they too are on the list of um, newspapers that have employed private detectives, private investigators, to provide them with information. Now, sometimes that can be... Um, just as, as really meaningless, a, lazy, a journalist, instead of going to look at a, what we would say, go to look at an electoral roll for, to find an address, would ring the, 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 the office PI mm. and say, can you get me the address of Joe Blogs? Mm. And that's logged as an official request. And, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. They might have just checked the phone book, but being lazy, they said, somebody mm. else, will you get me the address? So some of these things are quite innocuous, others are not. And blagging? This is well, blagging, quite, quite innocuous. No, no, no I, don't, I don't say that. Mm. And I don't know that blagging occurs in this country. Certainly um, sweet-talking, mm. where you, um, in effect, try to convince an interview subject that you're going to be their best friend and do the best thing you mm. can for them in order to get it and keep it away from you. Competitor. That goes on extensively. It's part of the, mm. the, 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 the yeah. art, the trade, I but suppose. Do you think but could I could... In, in, is where you, you phone up and, and say you're somebody else mm. and, and seek personal information. Do, could, could I ask all of you this? Do you think in a, the news that Murdoch made it worse for himself by the cover-up? <laughs> it... it, it the, the, the line yep. that sort of became unravelled. The, well, the fact yeah, that this was yeah. the lone report of the lone event yeah. and they stuck with that even though they knew this mm. was nonsense. Absolutely and agree that now you can say that without fear of contradiction. I am not sure if you had been the boss of the company at the beginning of this that you would have said, righto, I'm now going to bear my my soul to everybody coming along. I'm not, I'm, I'm not sure. It's human nature and it's kind of corporate nature, isn't it? Well, yeah. well Richard Nixon did it. Now, I'm not just putting that up as an example of success. But no, but it's always the cover-up that brings you nature. down. Exactly, the cover-up is worse. Not, not the nature, so, so not people the are not learning. Mm. It's, the um, it's the nature of corruption. But, I mean, anybody who's worked in newsrooms, and Rupert certainly has, knows what Mark said earlier, that when an editor gets a story that... You know, the source isn't evident. There's a basic list of questions that you run through, including how do we know this? Is it true? And those sorts well, of that's questions. what I mean. Yeah, and we're, we're, we're must paying have, this guy a hundred thousand pounds a year. You don't need to ask any yeah. more. And oh, yeah. Rupert must have known, or James must have known. That Rebecca Brooks yeah. must have known. If Rebecca Brooks Book didn't know, she shouldn't have been in the job. Exactly. Mm. And mm. to continue to protect her, and, and one of mm. the big questions at the moment is, is she still really on the payroll? I don't know the answer to that. Mm. But to continue to uh, support and protect like her Mark in that position mm. um, is absolutely culpable, and there's no getting away from it. Mm. Absolutely culpable. Look, it amazes me that to stand these stories up, you know, the front page splash in the news of the world about someone's private private life or mm. whatever. Or cystic a lawyer, fibrosis. Or cystic fibrosis, fibrosis the Prime Minister's um, um, young son and so, whatever. Yeah. The lawyer that. would go through it and said, look, you know, we've got to be careful of defamation here and what, what's the story, mm. what, what are your sources mm. like, what are you... Those questions would be asked long before it even got to the lawyer. <laughs> and, yet, uh, and frequently the lawyer would say, uh, this is a major depot and it, it would be uh, we worth need to a be able to defend And they'll it. still go ahead. And the, and the Murdoch family continued to employ Rebecca Brooks in those senior positions and continued mm. to back her even as recently as a few Keep weeks ago. Her. And continued to pay the legal fees of mm. the private detective who is a mm. felon. Now, at that point... Mm. They are culpable, and there is no getting away from that. Look, there's an inquiry no here at News Limited yeah. into uh, whether there's been naughty third-party payments, and a couple of judges from Victoria are, are oversighting this, uh, retired judges. Bernie Teague being one of them, who for 20 years did the legal work for Helton Weekly Times, uh, before Rupert took it over, I might say. But... Nonetheless, he's very well yeah. aware of the health and he sat on the bench and, uh, and, and he against them. And, and it, it just strikes me, look, there was an inquiry in, in America at News Corporation. These inquiries go nowhere. They're just, we're having an inquiry and that's the, the inquiry into the floor graphics 
computer hacking by a news corporation by the guy that ran a news marketing, uh, uh, sorry, um, what was it called? News America news Marketing. America, yeah. And that hacked into the computers of a small advertising company. They stole all their clients, and, and Rupert ended up, you know, once the, once the smaller company started to sue News Corporation, uh, Rupert bought them and paid them a lot of hush money and so on. Now, there was an inquiry into that conducted by um, Mr. Din, the um, Vietnamese guy who's on the board of News Corporation, who was in fact the architect of uh, George W. Bush's phone hacking operations <laughs> under the Patriot Act. Um, and of course it went nowhere. Is this inquiry in News Limited actually going to, you know, find anything? Was the, you mean the one in Australia? Yeah. I, I don't know, I can't answer. Um, uh, when I heard of it, that they're going to review all editorial payments uh, for the last three years, I said, why three years? Uh, uh, should be five. Uh, should be five, should be ten. Uh, who, who can tell? Um, I, I really don't know. Um, and the News America one you refer to, well, um, the jury's very much out on that because this, that now they're, uh, they're shaping up for a, um, a wider public inquiry probably involving the FBI. So we'll know in time just how far these things go. But, you know... Now, now Rod, um, let's get back to the, to the fallout from all of this. The, the, the idea that there might be some good that has come out of the news of the world thing, not just in Britain, <laughs> maybe here, that people look at the influence of the media in relation to politics, the, the mm. extraordinary... Um, insider sort of track that large media proprietors have with with politicians and governments, and with the police and with the law. Do you do you see something good coming, or do, will it all just fizzle away as memories fade and you know we're back to back to back to the normal old life again? I I don't think it will all fizzle away. <clears throat> I think that possibly some good will come out of it. I think. Mark made a point earlier that it's possible that some harm will come out of it. I actually, because of the, um, see, it's like you you say the Guardian and and uh, or, or the Sydney Morning Herald and whatever's ABC is saying we're doing legitimate investigative reporting. We're not part of this, you know, muckraking. But it's very hard. It's like trying to make a traffic law, a set of traffic laws, and say, well, these sets of traffic laws are for good drivers and those sets of traffic laws are for bad drivers. You can't sort of make them that way. So I think there may well be tighter privacy provisions coming out. Is that a bad thing? That's Well, we haven't seen them yet. But I would think they... they Talked in privacy. Yeah. Remedies I, I, and damages I, 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 and injunctions. Yeah, I would think there's, there's probably more good than bad in that, but it, mm. it depends a bit how far it reaches. Um, uh, I would think there'll be stronger codes coming about how journalists can represent themselves to others, and I think more often than not that will be a good thing probably mm. um, and uh, what about um, relationships with with you know sources of information like the police yeah I mean there is this idea that you, you, you get and maybe it's not you know exclusively confined to news limited journalists but journalists do say to a, a source look don't you talk to someone else because if you do, I'll give you a hard time. Don't you talk to yes. my opposition? Yeah. Um, you know, I want the, I want a lid on you. I want to own you, and I'll monster you if you step outside the. There has been an ethic of bullying <laughs> in News Limited, especially in Britain um, and America, and to some ex lesser extent here, probably. And but how do you legislate against that? It's mm. very tricky. Mm. I, I I don't know. I I know it happens. I think, I think one of the most dangerous things to come out of this, for those of us who value free free press, is that throughout it, it's clear that the behaviour of the news corporation has been just like any other political party or dodgy corporation who's in trouble. 
and it makes it very hard to get up and say the media's on the side of the public when they have been as misleading, um, uh, deceptive, um, economical with the truth and so forth as any dodgy corporation ever has been. Mark, maybe you'd like to say something. I think where, when you talk about <coughs> um, uh, ill has been done, it must be corrected. The next question is, well, what do we do? If there are any moves, whether they be through privacy or through controlling um, free speech, then remember that it's your free speech that will be impacted as well as Rupert's or his editors or, or individual journalists. Any move to, to roll back your capacity to think and speak openly and freely, uh, to roll back the media's capacity to, to comment or, or to report freely, also impacts on the individual, as it, as it must, because the rule must apply to everyone. So I think a, a privacy tort is probably not far away. We've been moving inexorably mm. towards it. It's interesting that this privacy report that the government has just dusted off after sitting for two years on a, on a shelf, uh, doing absolutely nothing. Um, it's got something like 2,900 pages, Mm. and uh, seven or eight pages apply to the role of journalism. Mm. So the privacy issue goes way beyond just what you can read in the papers or what you can see on television. Mm. Um, and, and it's a much bigger issue. Everybody knows how many times you have to state your mother's maiden name and the name of your dog <laughs> and your, you know, to get any information about yourself. <laughs> and that's where the big privacy issues mm. lie, I think. Okay. Um, I think, yes, I think a privacy tort is just about inevitable. It already exists mm. in most other jurisdictions which have journalistic regimes like ours. Mm. Um, the other good that could come of this is a higher level of ethical awareness within the profession. It's mm. woefully low, just woefully low. Um, and if that alters, mm. then that will be a good thing. Um, the, um, the American Constitution, which guarantees freedom of the press, it's often seen as applying to media organisations, but in fact it was originally conceived as being about citizens' rights mm. to gather and mm. speak. And we're rapidly, of course, moving to a situation where in the Western world at least just about anybody with access to a computer can publish information. Mm. We're rapidly moving to a situation where that idea of the right to freedom of speech absolutely does reside with each and every one of us. And the news corporations of the world um, have in any case, even before the news of the world, you know, one of the big historical trends is a reduction in their power. This will speed that. And, you know, it's not about whether Rupert Murdoch is a saint or a sinner in the end. He's both, I suspect, you know, in different ways. Mm. Um, it's not even about whether News Corporation is a good organisation or not. It's simply far too powerful. It is. It has been far too so powerful. So if I could and, just... And anybody, about that. And, Can no, you let me I finish. And let me finish. Mm. And anybody, you know, Rupert himself in his young days said that people shouldn't be allowed that mm. sort of concentration of media ownership. Mm. Now, what do we do about it? Well, it seems that everyone was afraid of... <laughs> afraid well, of we get to it. <laughs> you know, I'm sorry to interrupt, but mm. that, that was the, just speed things mm. up because we want to get to the questions. Sure. But, but, you know, that was the issue and that's what's happened in Britain. The fear factor has been broken. Mm. That the Politicians will not now go and bend the knee to, to Rupert and answer his phone mm. calls and turn up at his or, cocktail or parties. possibly the reverse. And Rupert you won't know, go to don't, theirs. Don't, don't <laughs> think, don't for a second think mm. that this is a one-way street. It's true. <laughs> the politicians have been going to Rupert and getting on their knee begging him That's for support. That's what I'm support. talking about. And That's even what I'm talking about. So I thought you meant that Rupert would go to the politicians. No, 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 no. no I'm, well, I'm talking about... Mm. The, 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 I mean, in, in Britain now, now a politician would not... would take his time to... Respond to a phone call from James or, or Rupert Murdoch. Just you know, well, right. well, really, what's he ringing me for? My point is the other way around. Rupert might take his time to pick up the. But phone he's from lost the, the he's lost the golden halo, oh. and um, 
I mean, I notice, Miss, you know, the Prime Minister here is still on the knee. She goes to little private sessions with the News Limited editors. But that's been going on forever. Yeah, I've been but what them. goes on behind there? Why can't we know? I mean, are they talking about the NBN? Are they talking about, well, could I, uh, could I just, you know, the takeover just, of can I just interrupt you? Foxtel? The, the, the first time I did this, Malcolm Fraser was the Prime Minister, and mm. he wanted to come to talk to the editors. He had something he wanted to sell. And this is portrayed as, uh, you know, the, the other way around. Mm -hmm. And it's not so. Well, it's very can, much the sorry, interaction Rob. between the politicians I, and the press, not only Murdoch, it's a two-way street. Just quickly, and then we'll have some questions. Well, the last two comments, Mark, is made I agree with. So I want to go back to the third last one that I disagree with. <laughs> uh, and uh, and that you said that uh, these are our rights to free speech that are being impinged on. But there is a degree of monopoly power here. I won't go into the details, but Piers Ackerman once completely distorted some things I'd said. Didn't, you know, I mean, it was just... He, 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 he must have a strange form of dyslexia where he can only see the bits in a sentence that agree with the point that he wants to make. So I put some effort into trying to get a, a correction in the telegraph. Completely ignored, completely whatever. I think that if, there, if it's about my freedom of speech and lots of other people, I need some redress I didn't want to sue or anything. I need some redress mm. to say, you got me completely wrong. Here is the evidence. And I and would at say the you moment, should have it. Good on you. There you okay. go. <laughs> but I can't speak for Peter's. <laughs> <laughs> the floor is now open for general debate and confrontation. <laughs> Terry Ma, I've, uh, oh, yes, Terry Ma. <laughs> I've worked with most of you and I've worked for the Australian City, Melbourne, Brisbane and Canberra. Max and Newton. I've... Did you work for Max Newton? Yes, I did. Yes. <laughs> and they call me old. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, my question is to Mark and the panel about um, <clears throat> now that the news of the world is gone, um, how does the time survive without that income from the sun and the news of the world. And um, the, the second question is, of course, how does the Australian survive without the Telegraph and the Herald Sun? Mm. Well, that's um, hypothetical at the moment <laughs> uh, in, in relation to the Australian uh, newspapers. Nothing has changed. And uh, <clears throat> I was publisher of the Australian once uh, back in 1976. And um, in one year, we had one week where we made a profit. Every other week was a loss, and sometimes they were six-figure losses. So the dedication to, uh, to keep the, uh, the product alive has been there and long-standing for um, and that was, well, all its life. And that was market punishment for what the Australian did in 1975. Uh, 19, yes, well, that's right. Uh, <laughs> and, and it went through a very, very difficult time after that because of um, the 1975. The, and the dismissal. Um, but uh, the, the, the company has assets beyond just... I mean, the Sunday Times uh, makes a, a heap, and that would keep the Times alive for some time. But look, uh, beyond that, if Rupert were still in charge, if Rupert wanted to, and his board allowed or agreed him to, then you could take the profits of Avatar or Titanic and throw a few of them towards, uh, or Fox, uh, Fox um, News Channel, or the television interests in America, which are throwing up vast amounts of cash. You could use some of that if you wish. Um, I don't think it's a newspaper only, uh, all in a single silo. Waving. Not Hello. Um, first of all, I'd just like to say this is the most humble day of my life. <laughs> <laughs> I'd just like to ask the panel, um, to what extent do you think people get the newspapers they deserve? Mm. Margaret? Um, oh, it's such a complicated question because things are changing so fast. I mean, increasingly, people don't get newspapers at all, let alone the newspapers they deserve. The websites they deserve. Yes, but I do think increasingly, um, as I was trying to indicate earlier, and, and part of the answer to Mark's question, what do you do about it, increasingly there is a responsibility on engaged citizens 
to take up their responsibilities in terms of freedom of speech and interaction with the media. And I'm not talking about citizen journalism being the answer to all our problems, I don't think it is. But nor will it go away, and it is important. And I think increasingly it's important for citizens to get active, to engage, to report sometimes, to comment, to talk back. Um, you know, we've talked in exclusively about News Limited here tonight, but Fairfax is also extremely vulnerable. Both the City Morning Herald and The Age are now into loss, is my information. You know, we may be looking at a situation within the next five years where we lose all of the broadsheet newspapers in Australia. That will be a civic emergency. And what are we all going to do about that is a very big and urgent and important question. <clears throat> Yes, um, um, and then there's a gentleman in the front as well. Hi, um, we haven't quite got this far in the conversation, but going back to ethics, what I'm really, like, given this opportunity, what I really want to know is what place do newspapers have in endorsing political parties? Um, my understanding is that, you know, everything should be viewed as an independent perspective or... Uh, looking at it as an individual opinion, but as a collective, newspapers coming out and making statements on who they endorse in terms of a policy or a paper, that just does not seem right to me. And yeah, I mean, I've worked at the Australian Channel 9 in the West and that just constantly just is, just doesn't seem right. Could I, did you, did, sorry, did you say you worked for the Australian and Channel 9? I used to, but you used not to. a fan And anymore. were you directed in certain ways to, to write? Oh, um, or you felt obliged to write in a certain not way? Not that so much, just um, little insights and conversations and, and I have spoken to people and seen how Ruben has got messages across um, mm. through artificial forms. I mean, people know what he thinks, basically. He doesn't tell people. Well, um, a, in my experience, River by osmosis, yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, yes, that's fine. Well, you went to a lot of trouble ringing all the editors up to ask yes, them. Yes, I did, as a matter of fact. Did they I, get directions? And I said, None of them you, did. I said, uh, do you get directions from River? And each of them said no. <laughs> they were all singing from the same song. But, but they got to be editors within a particular that's right, corporate but, culture. <laughs> Well, I mean, um, you talk about corporate culture, it's vastly different from market to market, and that's the, what the editors point out. It's horses for courses, and it's a matter of being as popular as you can in your market. To come to your question about uh, political endorsements, this is a historical thing. Back in the days of the penny press, there were a lot more titles. The... the um, the public had a greater choice of, of newspapers uh, in number and what they stood for. Some people were on the side of business, some papers were on the side of business, some people were on, on the side of the worker, and they made their endorsements to their readers. Now, as the number has become fewer, uh, this process has continued. But look, um, there may be fewer newspapers, but there are more choices today than ever before on where you get your information and how you get your information. It comes at you from every source relentlessly all the time and it is your job to pick and choose what you what is relevant to you and what you want to believe. It's as simple as that. If, as long as the media gives you choices, they may not all be on the same platforms as we say these days, but as long as the choices are there, then I think it's a pretty healthy society. Mm. Not everyone has that ability to... Well, what? 82% of Australians have access to internet, so you're saying 18% that don't? Why? They choose not to? Yeah, but if they're looking at news sites and we're looking at mainstream papers... Well, who, they look where they want to look. <laughs> they don't, nobody tells them where to look. Nobody <laughs> tells them what to think. Yeah. If I tell but you about Labour, will you? Yeah. No, you'll make up your own mind. I, I, think, I, think, I think if we're looking at the quality of a news... Let's say news newspaper for now. Two of my most important criteria uh, is that there's a diversity and pluralism of opinion within their opinion columns and there is an independence and accuracy of how they do their reporting which is independent of which side it might happen to report. And, um, and I actually think that that some newspapers have gone, according to those measures, have declined in recent years rather than gone up.
Mm. Okay, another question from the maybe the gentleman at the front. Yeah, in terms of what's happened in England, um, we've got an unholy trinity of the media, the politicians and the police all in bed with each other um, with this seething morass of corruption. Um, this, obviously, is there any connection between this and what's happening in London at the moment? And are people um, cynical about the media? Are they turning off um, main, mainstream commercial press and using social media to make their own news and to communicate with each other? Um, in terms of whether there's a connection between the rioting in the UK at the moment and the news of the world scandal, I don't know. I think that's too big a question. I don't know how you go about establishing such a thing. <coughs> Pardon me. In terms of cynicism and turn-off factor, it's interesting. There is actually no evidence at all of declining appetite for news and information. None whatsoever. The reverse. There, the reverse, indeed. Well, the media. Yes. Um, if you take all the platforms and all the ways in which mainstream media these days get the material out there, there is no evidence of a declining readership. That's including web and print and Twitter and Facebook and all the different platforms that mainstream media use. However, there is also something else as well. You know, citizens are doing it for themselves. We saw this in the Arab Spring. We've seen it even in the United Kingdom rights and so on. People are now telling the world, publishing. Anybody can publish. This is the thing that's new in human history. We have never before had a situation where just about anybody within a few minutes of deciding to do so can publish news and views to the world. And over time, we have to expect that to change absolutely everything about he, how we live together in societies. Mm. It will be the equivalent revolution to the Gutenberg printing press, which did change everything, including democratic forms and ideas of God and the power of the church. It took a few centuries for all that to happen. <laughs> the pace of change is quicker now, but I think we're constantly at risk of underestimating the profundity of the change through which we're living. Mm. And you know, the Murdoch empire will be gone very quickly and will only be a small part of that story. Um, so, so hmm? can you tell us when? Well, no, I can't. <laughs> but I think we're talking. I mean, and I think Mark and I are in broad agreement on this. I think we, you know, we're going to see the end of the Murdoch period within a year or two, probably. In in the nineteen seventies, mm. I remember Graham Perkin and Max Walsh saying. With all these cheaper printing presses, there is going to be a flowering of new newspapers in Australia. Mm. Do you think it'll happen soon? I, I, <laughs> I think it will. I mean, I've alluded to the emerging civic emergency of the possibility of us losing all of our broadsheet newspapers. I'm not, I'm not particularly wedded to, you know, ink on dead trees, but what I'm talking about is the numbers of journalists, you know, dozens to hundreds of journalists employed. But what I do think we will see is legacy media shrinking. We will see as yet undreamt of startups because the barriers to entry are now quite low. And we will see the existing players such as Crikey, which I work for, which are already at the situation of employing perhaps a dozen journalists. And we will see a very crowded marketplace of modestly profitable news outlets, all of them employing perhaps a dozen, perhaps two dozen journalists, many of them owned by private uh, proprietors who keep them alive partly because they care about it. It will be a crowded marketplace, there will be a huge effort to differentiate within that, which will include political differentiation, mm. playing to the political spectrum, will include things like games, Mark. <laughs> um, all sorts of things will be in that space to try and differentiate and find their niche markets. And I think that's perhaps five years away. OK, well, if you find any of these Gosh. private proprietors, let me know. Um, <laughs> we've got one more question, maybe for time for one more. Is that possible? Um, yeah, my question is just kind of following on from what you were just talking about. Um, Margaret, it was really interesting what you were talking when you were talking about uh, the point not being whether Rupert's you know, good or evil, but the, the fact that his corporation is so powerful. Um, following on from that and just talking about you know, the concentration of media ownership, do you think that what's happened now with phone hacking is sort of going to be a new dawn in terms of media accountability, or do you think it's it's going to be a blip and things are going to be back to normal within a year. I think it's a tipping point within bigger historical trends, which I've alluded to, which are about changes in technology. Um, 
and it's a hugely significant change in technology. But I think it's a tipping point, and, and Richard referred to it earlier. You know, only a few months ago, sucking up to Rupert was a very good thing to do. It's now not something any politician wants to be seen to be doing, even if they're still doing it behind the scenes. Um, that's a huge change. That is a big change, and I don't think it's going to be wound back. I think that's the situation now. And in terms of the cultural change, including in Australia, I think, you know, Western world, that's an enormous change to the way business is done. Mm. And, a, and a healthy one. Mark, if I could you, I just make one point on um, the, the power of news corporation. I think it is uh, overrated to a degree. Um, and I say that um, it's only been uh, 15 years that news has been trying to get the anti-siphoning laws changed so um, pay television can get out in the market and compete with, uh, uh, on a level playing field, as they say, for sporting rights and, and that kind of thing. Uh, all through the, um, the uh, Prime Ministership of John Howard, which uh, Murdoch and the newspapers uh, generally supported, uh, <coughs> they wouldn't budge, the Labour Party won't but uh, There are many things that um, they find themselves absolutely powerless on, mm. and that's probably not a bad thing. Uh, but you know, it, it's it's easy to say this all-powerful global corporation. In reality, it doesn't quite work that way. Ma uh, uh, Rod, could we have a final word from you, please? Um, well, just to take up that point. I, some of you here may be old enough to remember Sir Arthur Warner, a leading um, uh, minister in the Balti government. Uh, when he was minister for transport, he wanted to take all the free water um, bubblers off railway stations and replace them with drink machines owned by his company. What's wrong the anti-siphoning laws <laughs> which have meant that the public gets all these things for free now and, uh, and under Murdoch's rules, people that get things for free now would have to pay for them is deeply unpopular with public opinion and just because there are some limits on his power to go so completely against public opinion and all prudent politicians see this doesn't mean that we should underestimate his power in other ways. Okay, that was uh, terrific. I'd, I'd like you very much to uh, join me in thanking uh, Margaret, Mark and Rob. <laughs> You can uh, turn your uh, heart machines back on now. Um, the Talking Point series rolls on and on and on. Um, it's, it's the details, like tonight, you can find on the Wheeler Centre's website, wheelercentre.com. And it's on Twitter, isn't it now? At Wheeler Centre, I think. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.